today's show, we have our guest, David Goa, and we're going to be talking about religious cults, and also secular cults. Not all religions are cults, but even religions that are not cults, they can, some of them can have cultic elements. Also, there's the concept of the cult of personality, or when politicians become cult leaders, or when things in their lives become idolatries. Can sports become a cult? Can gyms become a cult? Can hobbies become a cult? Can celebrities become a cult? Can ideas become a cult? Can political movements become cultish? What are your thoughts on this? And is the concept of a religious cult excessively narrow or can it be expanded to other things like I've just mentioned? David Gould? The word cult is, uh, in the history of religions, is applied to uh, the center of worship of a particular religious community. It's their cult. So we speak of the cult of the mass, for example. Roman Catholics still speak about it that way. Where does the word come from? Cult is, of course, the root of the word culture. Culture is a verbal in Latin. That is, it's not something, but it is something we do. So, uh, it's maybe easier to understand the meaning of the word when we think of agriculture, or we think of horticulture, or we think of the culture of a petri dish. What's happening there? Well, things are being cultivated. Things are being cultivated. So, when we think of religious cults, and, uh, you know, there was a very famous book here in Alberta written by a scholar named Mann called Sex Cults and Religions in Alberta. Many years ago, written back in the early 60s, I believe. And he was sort of dividing up religious groups and putting them in these different baskets. And often people do that, uh, devout people in various churches sometimes refer to others as, as a cult. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to jump above that a little bit and um, think about what's actually going on here. So if we go back to the root of it, what is it you worship? What are you burning incense to? What are you bowing down in front of? What are you petitioning? What are you seeking to emulate? Seeking to come into an intimate relationship? What is it you are seeking to draw near to? So, because that's what you're cultivating. That's central. So perhaps there's a, a, a distinction that can be made between strong discipline and strong religion, for example, but strong discipline if we think of athletics and the arts, having a strong discipline and when that becomes a cult, maybe this will be helpful. Let's, let's try this a little bit. So for example, anyone who's serious about their religious faith is going to be devoted to it and it's going to follow the disciplines of it. Uh, they've come to understand that it, by following those disciplines, it, it it cultivates things in me. It leads to my transformation. And we may understand it as leading to becoming a better person, leading one to become closer to God, leading one to, to becoming more Christ-like, as we often say within, within the Orthodox tradition. When we look at some organizations that are understood to be cults and where that really has risen up. What, what do we see in them? Well, what we think we see is that they have strong disciplines, 
but that the, the, the disciplines are all focusing on something that we see as being, well, the most generous thing I could say, I suppose, is strangely peculiar. That is, it may focus on a leader, a particular leader. And so that the homage being paid isn't even to what the leader is teaching, it's to the leader himself or herself. And then life gets organized around that. Because religion, of course, is, I mean, the word, the word is a Latin word, you know, its root is ligament. It's how do you hold the bones of life together? So when you think of religion as being the disciplines around integration, around holding the various parts of your life together, in deepening the union in your life, the integrity in your life. Well, all disciplines, all, all you know, if you're going to be a violinist or, or if you're an athlete, this requires tremendous devotion. You don't become good at something by not doing it a lot. You become good by developing serious discipline. What's the difference between that kind of discipline and it's suddenly turning into something that's cultic? Well, I would suggest that it's when the discipline that you've been working at when the discipline you've been working at is no longer serving whatever that art is at the center of it. In the case of playing the violin, when it's no longer really serving the music. In the case of an athletic uh, event, when it's no longer really serving the joy of that kind of physical engagement. Or in the case of, in the case even of, of our, our church and our liturgy, when, when we no longer are being called into the joy of our salvation, into a deeper communion with everybody we know, including our enemies. When that's no longer unfolding, when we need to examine what's really going on. So, you mentioned secular notions. So I think one of the, one of the questions always to ask is, uh, is, is what I'm devoting myself to, what I'm disciplined around, what I'm really devoted to, what is it serving? Is it serving the life of God's world? Is it serving my family, my tribe? What is it serving? I remember Thomas Merton, the uh, Cistercian monk, being interviewed years ago down at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. And the journalist asked him, made some comment about how rigorous and disciplined their life was in the Cistercian Monastery. And Merton laughed and he said, oh, come on. We have wine at every meal. We grow all our own food. We have music every day. We read. What are you talking about? We're not ascetics. We have a full life here at the monastery. You want to meet an ascetic? You want to meet somebody who's really an ascetic? Go to New York and follow a young executive. Because those people give up everything for the sake of the corporation. Yes. For the sake of the corporation. Yes. So their life becomes oriented around that. Their play becomes oriented around that. Everything becomes oriented around that. So in a sense, the cultic move is the move when what you thought you were doing it for is no longer the point the point has become an abstraction. It might be a person, it might be your pension plan. You know, that happens often enough. 
So it seems to me that we have to be careful about whether this is about rigorous discipline, which I don't think it is. Cults require rigorous discipline, but I think they turn them inside out. The discipline no longer is in service to what it was intended to be in service to. It's in service to somebody's megalomania. So you believe the core root of cult leaders is probably a form of narcissism to bend other people to their will. So they can draw other people's attention to themselves? I can't imagine it isn't. Yeah. But I mean, narcissism is something that floats around in our society. Lots of us have been touched by it. Um, it's very difficult for people in positions of authority to even get there if they aren't a bit narcissistic, <laughs> you know. So, but it is, it is of course, one of, the, um, one of the temptations and one of the diseases, one of the passions. We call them neuroses these mm -hmm. days, but in the ancient church they called them passions. So it's something that the Christian tradition, the Orthodox tradition, is all about. It's all about how to heal that so that that doesn't run away with your life and despoil your life. Interesting. But how many things can actually be, can turn into a cult, like secular things? And we were talking about the workplace, giving your life to a, a corporation. We talked about politics, political leaders, giving yourself to a political ideology that can derail. But can there be sports? Can there be gym cults? Can there be, like how many things can be Well, I think that uh, that possibility, the possibility of good things mm -hmm. becoming so imbalanced that they devour your life, that's possible with anything. The wonderful thing about the Orthodox teaching on the spiritual life is that all of God's creation is a good thing. That's not the problem. The problem is when good things get turned in and devour the rest of your life. That's called sin. And um, So if you're sacrificing, you, let's say my hobby or making money or the praise of others, if everything else is falling apart around my life, then you, we can probably say that's probably my idol. Of course, yeah. I mean, that's a good term for it. I mean, Idolatry is an indication of the fact that you, you are worshiping something. It's become central to your life instead of your life itself and your relationships. So in a lot of ways, could our education system almost be an idol? Like if we're chasing after degree, after degree, after degree. Well, we have to be careful. There is this. There is a difference between the cultivation of skill yep. and the cultivation of knowledge and the disciplines necessary for that. Mm -hmm. Those disciplines are good, but of course they also can turn. I've mm -hmm. tried to describe that turn a little bit. They can turn and become the only thing you're serving them. They're not serving you. Discipline is meant to, to lead to some end. The disciplines of the church have an end. It's cultic in the church. It becomes a cult if you think saying the prayer rope 500,000 times is the point. The point of saying the prayer rope, the point of the disciplines of the church of prayer and fasting isn't prayer and fasting. It's transformation. It's to become holy. So it becomes cultic when the thing itself has become the point. It is a discipline when those things are serving what the point is, in the case of our church, transformation to become holy.